I'm so excited. I'm so excited. This is so exciting. And nervous. I've never done this before. Me either. This is my first time ever doing a podcast. This is like <laughs> the t- awkward, scary team. Welcome everybody to the first ever episode slash interview of that missionary podcast. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Just so you know, if, if I cough a little bit, just I caught something in the snow. Because we walked through a crazy amount of snow to get here. It was crazy. It was, it was we have <coughs> world record amounts of snow coming in Buffalo, New York right now. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. And I'm supposed to drop you off at the airport at like what? One in the morning? Tomorrow. <laughs> Woo! Little disclaimer. This looks all professional. Like we have this cool mic that works. Fun fact, it's not even plugged in. <laughs> We, <laughs> I tested it out. This mic is like broken or something. <laughs> so we, we ended up just using our the voice memos on our phone. So he's recording his, I'm recording mine. I hope this audio turns out good. If not, we'll just use the audio from my camera mic. If this is a complete garbage episode, well, it's only uphill from here. Or downhill from here? Up from here? Up from here. Up from here. Yeah. We're just going to go with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is the first time ever doing a podcast for me, for you. Mm-hmm. It's the first ever missionary podcast. Um, there's a few things that I want to hop into with like your mission experience, but I, I do want to give some background. So this is my friend Nephi Garcia, Hello. also known as the Designer Daddy <laughs> the on designer the daddy. interwebs. <laughs> he makes like big movie costumes and ball gown dresses. We're actually working on a project together. We're making a little show of renovating a 200 year old church into a Disney castle. Ta-da! It's it's a big project, but we're super excited about it. I think it's going to turn out amazing. I mean, why wouldn't you want to live in a Disney castle? You know, like, why wouldn't you? Especially because the way that they it all came about, he was in the celestial room with his wife. They were praying to know what they need to do. And the Lord was like, move to the East Coast, buy an old church, and renovate it, it into, into a castle. Into a castle. <laughs> Very specific. Very specific. Very and he specific. acted on it. Yeah. And because he acted on it, we actually met. And now we're best friends. You know, a lot it's of funny because projects. there's so many opportunities we could have met. Yes, yeah. Like, I met his family when I was on my mission because I actually served my mission where he's from mm-hmm. in Carlsbad. That's, that's where I served. And I just, <coughs> excuse me, I served in his ward and his family's ward. When I was like three. He was like three. <laughs> Crazy. I was in a high chair, like eating. I <laughs> know. Like, that's so funny. You <laughs> served in the Carlsbad mission. I did. So tell a little bit about where you're from because you're from the Philippines. Yeah. So Explain I, all that. I was born and raised in the Philippines. I grew up in a church. My my parents joined the church in the seventies. They were actually one of the first families to join the church throughout the Philippine history. Oh wow! Um, yeah, so I think the the church went to the Philippines in like late sixties. Okay. And that's when they started. Um, the church started like proselyting in the in the islands, and then uh, my family. Um, they opened up a mission where my town is and then my family joined the church and yeah, so it's kind of crazy because like when you, when you talk about like pioneer here, you talk about like the one that crossed the plains, you know, Mm -hmm. but in the Philippines, when you talk about pioneer, the first few people that joined the church and so they always consider my family a pioneer. No way. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. But like, so yeah, my, my family, um, so I guess that makes me like third generation member of the church in the Philippines. And, um, and you know, so I, I, I wanted to go on a mission. You know, I, I filed for my <coughs> mission papers when I was 18 and I got it. And surprisingly, you know, I, I got called to serve in Carlsbad, California, Tagalog speaking. So I didn't have to learn language, it was kind of nice. But when I went to the MTC, I had to, you know, improve my English. So I actually learned English and and kind of changed my accent a little bit, you know, and get used to the way Americans speak because it's, it's completely different. And yeah, and then I was there for three months and I served a mission in Carlsbad. Best mission in the world. Let's go, let's go. And because of that mission experience, you were able to learn English. Uh-huh. You were able to try American food for the first time. Oh my gosh, yeah. I lost so much weight on my mission. <laughs> usually, <coughs> excuse me, usually you gain a lot of weight on your mission, you know? Yeah. It's like you eat so much. Mm-hmm. It just went through me. I don't know why. I was, just, at, I was at the end. Did you hate it? Yeah, well, 
it was it was interesting. Okay, so I, I was at the MTC and we started eating. I'm like, what is this? Because in the Philippines, we eat a lot of like fresh vegetables and rice and meat, you know, like like very spicy, hearty kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I went to the MTC and I'm like, eating mashed potato. I'm like, why are they serving me baby food? That was my first thought. I was like, <laughs> why are they serving me baby food? And why are all the vegetables raw? Because like, you know, like the salad bar. Yeah. So we have salad in the Philippines, but you know, with with you know, like the different kind of types of water that we use, we yeah. usually try, tend to like cook everything to be safe. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, no, hey, all the vegetables are raw and they're feeding me mashed potatoes and baby food and baby food. boiled vegetables, like the boiled carrots. I'm like, I don't like this very much, but I had to eat. I had to nourish myself. Yeah. So I, I ate it anyway. It just went through me. And it was crazy because like I, I came on my mission. I was about like 150 pounds. And I left the MTC at 115. I lost so much no weight. No way! I was, I was like, I was skeleton. Yeah, no, I was skeleton. And <laughs> and everybody was like, "What's going on? Like, are you eating? Are you like?" They even thought that I was like, "What do you call it when they they puke their food out?" Oh, yeah. I forget what that's called. Like, anorexic. Like, anorexic. Yeah. They're like, "Are you anorexic?" I'm like, "No, I'm just like sick. It's not sticking into me. You know, like I don't know what's going on." <laughs> And then my last week, at, <coughs> excuse me, at the MTC, one of my companions was like, "Did you know that if you request fish and rice, they'll actually like make, make fish it and for, rice you? for you?" I'm like, "I had no idea this whole this time." This entire time, I'm yeah. dying. Yeah. So for the last week of the three months I was at the MTC, like I was like eating rice yeah. and fish. It was really good, but <laughs> yeah, I, I had no idea. And then, you know, like the whole raw, rare steak thing. Yeah. Completely new to me. In the really? Philippines, we cook everything thoroughly. Yeah. <coughs> and now and, you like yours rare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. I love it. So that's the funny thing is, is like, I grew up in like an American family. So yeah. I grew up eating all that stuff. Yeah. And then you grew up seafood stuff. And so like, now I'm over with you. And you're like, ooh, try this. Try this. I had sushi for the first time just a little bit ago. And you're like, giving me like... Eel. Like straight up like, like eel and like straight up like raw salmon and raw tuna. <laughs> and it's like, what is it? <laughs> but it's been fun. It's been super well, it's fun. That's good. That's good. You know, it's good to like experience different things, Expand I guess. Expand your palate. Absolutely. 100%. Everyone has hilarious moments in their mission. Like what is one of the most funny moments where, like when you, when a companion did something funny or something happened where you and your companion literally like almost peed your pants where you're like, that was hilarious. <laughs> Whew. Well, that's a good one, actually. I have plenty. <coughs> one time. Okay, so in the Philippines. Okay, so let me give you a scenario. In our apartment in, in California, we had six missionaries total, so three companionship. We have the English-speaking, um, Tagalog-speaking, and the Spanish-speaking in one household, right? And um, one of the English-speaking... Um, guy is actually Filipino. So they transfer. We do Tagalog speaking in our mission, but they don't want you to be in one area for two years. Mm-hmm. So they swap you out. They put you in English speaking once in a while. Um, and one of the Filipino guys was doing English, but we were roommates. So in the Philippines, we catch spiders. And <laughs> so we actually catch spiders. Like all the kids do it. We catch spiders and we like care for it like put it in like a little matchbox yeah and feed it and stuff mm-hmm. and then we like wrestle with other spiders it's called spider fight look it up on youtube it's really fascinating unless you're scared of <laughs> unless spiders. you're a missionary and you have monsters and <laughs> you can't look it up until you come you, home yeah <laughs> but, uh, or or you're like scared of spiders no but anyway so you get two spiders right and then you put them on a stick like a, like a barbecue stick like skewer okay and then you let them fight, and then they actually fight. And then whoever like, keeps falling out will eventually lose. Really? Yeah. And so me and my companion, we were like, okay, tomorrow's P day. Go find a spider, I'll find a spider, we'll play the spider mm-hmm. fight. And so we did, and my companion was deathly afraid of spiders. Yeah. He was like fascinated, he was like, I wanted to see this, but I'm extremely, extremely scared. Yeah. And so I'm like, you know what, we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> so I found this spider. It was a pretty hefty one. It was pretty big. <coughs> it was a pretty big spider. And then so I caught one. And then my other Filipino buddy caught one. Um, 
And on P-Day, we were, like, doing spider fight. And all the missionaries that came, the whole district, because we were all in one city, um, they all came. We, we did, like, a district P-Day. And they're all, like, rooting for one, you know? It, it was really fun. It's actually really fun. And then, um, except for him, he was just, like, on the chair the whole time. He was like this. He was like this the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> he was terrified. And I'm like... It's gonna be fine, you know, we have it covered. He was like, nope, I don't wanna look at it. I'm definitely afraid, I don't wanna look at it. We were like, okay, fine. So we gave it up that night. That night, he had a nightmare. Okay, so I, we usually keep the door open in our bedroom because he, he like sleepwalks once in a while. Your companion? Yeah, <laughs> and so for, for it to be safe, you know, we just open the door. He just walks around the living room and go back in bed. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he got up in the middle of the night and he was freaking out. He was like, get it off me, get it off me. And he was jumping on the bed and he forgot I actually shut the door. And so he's just like, get it off me. And he ran what? like, boom, into the door. Right onto the door. I just passed out on the floor. I woke up and like, what happened? And I was like, oh, you know, like, oh, whatever, nothing. So I went back to bed. The following morning, I woke up at 6.30 and he was on the ground <laughs> sleeping. I'm like... Are you okay? And then it makes sense to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, that you was the big bag. The <laughs> that was the big bag. <laughs> so I'm, like, okay. I'm, I'm like, I'm so sorry. Okay, no more spiders. That I'm is so, sorry. so funny. He had a nightmare and <laughs> ran into the door. Oh my god. That is so funny. <clears throat> so that was that was de- definitely one of the funniest experiences I've had. I love it. The the companion stories. Oh my gosh. So have you ever had a moment where you had like your companionship plus another companionship living in the same house? Yeah. That was like um, the ultimate dorm experience. Oh yeah, and there we had is. three companionships. Three at once? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Did anything fun happen there? Oh yeah. We we well on Sunday nights we call it P nights. P night. We still went to bed early. We still went to bed in time. But you know, just after <laughs> proselyting, we did all of our prayers together. We did all of our like like studies together and and whatnot and then yeah. we had a big late dinner together and late meaning nine thirty, you know uh-huh. um and and we just hung out you know we just basically like talked about what was going on that week and and who we were teaching it was still really spiritual and but it was so much fun to do it in a big group yeah yeah and it was it was so much fun it's like missionary fat house basically i love that so much i had multiple moments like that where it's just like literally a party oh yeah. these are crazy did you guys prank each other because we prank not each too other. hardcore but no, did not, you do not, anything not, crazy okay well we we put like jello in a in the shower cap have you done that no so you put like red jello <laughs> oh like, my or, no no that was kool-aid we put red kool-aid in the no and then one guy would just be showering all of a sudden like red water they're like oh my gosh what's going on that's so sticky oh yeah oh yeah (laughs) no like we this is this this, we had another prank actually like it turned out horrible don't do it but we put yellow jello in the toilet yeah and so it just looks like pee you know it just looks like because oh it's yellow gosh. but they didn't know it's actually like solidified uh. and somebody's like oh i'll just flush <laughs> it just overflowed no <laughs> we have to like cut up the jello for it before to go. you go and that's <laughs> that was oh my gosh. Gone bad that yeah. is so bad don't do that <laughs> don't do that don't do that that's so funny did you have a missionary scripture like that we read in the mission? Like your scripture. <coughs> you didn't have a missionary plaque. You were one of the few missionaries that didn't have one. I know, yeah. So you weren't able to pick I like a, one. a scripture for your mission. Yeah, so my, my ward actually... So, okay, backstory. Before I went on my, on my mission, me and my family were supposed to move to America. And, and my mom was like, just wait till we move to America and then you can file. You can go on a mission. I'm like, I'm almost 19. I just want to go on a mission. I don't want to wait. And she was like, okay. So when I went on my mission... Funny enough, I actually served in America and my family were headed to Los Angeles, which is like three hours away from my mission or two hours. Yeah. Um, and six months later in my mission, my family moved to LA. And so, and so my ward never made me a plaque because I, my family left and the ward we, I came home to didn't know. My mom didn't tell them that I have a son who's in a mission, so they never made me a plaque. I don't have one. Oh, my gosh. I know. I need one. We need to make one. That'd I be know. so sentimental. Yeah. Just like, oh, I have a missionary plaque. I know. I think that would be awesome. 
Okay, so if you were to pick a missionary <clears throat> scripture for like your missionary plaque, uh-huh. what would it be and why? It would probably be, uh, I think... You can look it up. Yeah, go for it. I think it's like DNC 139. You just happen to be in Doctrine and Covenants 1. What are the odds? Um, 38. DNC 138. Okay. You want to read it for us? <clears throat> so it says here, um, What I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken. And excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away. But shall all be fulfilled, whether by my own voice or by the voice of my servants. It is the same. I love that scripture so much. Um... Because, you know, I've, the times where I struggled in my mission where, um, you know, like, oh, nobody wants to listen to me. Nobody wants to hear what I have to say, you know, and I was already struggling with the language. Mm-hmm. And then I just have to remember, you know what, whatever I say, it's what the Lord would say to them. And so that kind of resonated to me. And then it helped me to stay focused and to stay righteous in my mission, you know, because I represent him what I would have to say what he would say, you know. I love that so much. What, to a missionary that might be on the edge about, like, everything, like, what what advice, like, I'm sure you might have been, like, district leader or something, or you gave trainings, what mm-hmm. advice did you give to missionaries that were having a hard time teaching people, or, like, what helped you be an effective missionary? So, what made it easier for me to become a missionary was knowing that the people that I'm, I've met, or I meet, have already accepted the gospel. You know, they are, they followed Christ, they came down here on earth, and they already have accepted that gospel, and they know what the gospel is. And my job was to remind them of what they already have accepted. And that made it so much easier for me, you know? I'm like, I'm not teaching them something crazy or something brand new or out of this world. I'm like, hey, guess what? You know about this, you know? Like, you've you've accepted this before, and I just just want to remind you, that's why the, the Spirit... It's a familiar feeling because it's a familiarity of where, what they have already or what we have already accepted. I love that so much because they wouldn't be here unless they did follow Christ. Absolutely. And trust in him. Yeah. That is powerful stuff. Did you have a moment? Because I, I remember teaching people when I was like, it hit. Like there's a light bulb that goes off in their head and you can see it in their eyes. They're like, this makes so much sense. Do you have like a particular story? Oh, was, yeah. Yeah? Um, we were attracting... Um, so we were track me and my companion, we were tracking and, and uh, um, we started, so we, we prayed really hard, you know, like we tried to pray as much as we can. And before we go track, we say a little prayer. I'm like, tell us what this person needs to know mm-hmm. if, if we, if she accepts or answers the door. So we prayed and then she answered the door and immediately me and my companions looked at each other and we're like, we're going to teach her about the plan of salvation. And that's what she needs. On the to doorstep. Write. On the doorstep. <laughs> and um, so we looked at each other. We started teaching her the plan of salvation. And she, she got so emotional. She just, she just knew it was true. And she was just like, knew it was true. 20 minutes into this teaching, right? The spirit was like, ask her to be baptized right now. I'm like, oh my God. No, I'm not going to do that. You know, like, I'm like, I'm not going to do that. It's crazy talk. And then looked at my companion. And he got teary-eyed because he felt... The same, same thing. Yeah, he, he heard the same voice. And we asked her to be baptized. And she said yes. No! <laughs> I know. It, it was crazy. That's crazy. So all three of us on the doorstep crying. Yeah. You know? And she was just like, I know I need to do this. I know Because we, we asked her, do you want to follow you know, Christ's example and be baptized? And she was like, yes. Yes. That's awesome. I know. It was, it was incredible. <laughs> and she just, we were all crying. And um, we found out she was actually outside of our area, one street outside of our area. No! I know! So we had to hand her over to the other elders and be like, please. Please take care of her. I know. Like, <laughs> please. That's the scariest thing when you refer someone out. <laughs> I know. Did she get baptized? She did end up joining a church. Um, it, was, it was an incredible experience. And, and the reason why what I said previously was to remind them is because when she said, she described her feeling of the spirit. It's, it was, she, she, she said it was like, it feels familiar. Yeah. You know, I'm like, that's when it hit me. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm yeah. not teaching them anything bogus, you know? Yeah. It's nothing new. They, they already know about this stuff. Yeah. So how do you cope? Because I've had multiple times when I uh-huh. teach somebody and they have that experience and they don't end up getting baptized. How do you like cope with that feeling? I just know that um, as long as I do my part, 
that I have planted the seeds, you know, mm-hmm. and that they're going to be taken care of. And because, you know, we've, we've had such an amazing spiritual experiences with a lot of people. And then they ended up like, oh, it's too hard for me to give, give up on this. Or yeah. it's too hard for me to like go to church. But there's always an excuse, you know, and, yeah. and I feel like Satan would always find a way for them to um, not do what they're supposed to do. Especially when they know that, when he knows that they're, he, they're progressing. Yeah. Satan's going to work really hard yeah. to, yeah. to, you know. It's the craziest thing. Happen. Once you put someone on date to be baptized, oh, the ever surge goes crazy on yeah. that person. You're like, what the heck? Yeah. Everything is like... Everything's coming out of nowhere. Oh, absolutely. Their car stops working or they get exactly. evicted. It's crazy. And the thing is, our, I think the, the best way to deal with that is, is we just have to remind them what the spirit is, uh, how the spirit feels. Because they could take it either way. They could take it to either like, like this is a sign that I shouldn't be baptized or Satan is working really hard. And you need to make that connection with Exactly. That, you know? 100%. You just have to make sure that they know. Mm-hmm. You know, like, just so you know, Satan is going to try his best to stop you from doing what's right. Yeah. And if they have that connection, they have the understanding, they're going to understand that, like, okay, you know, all the odds are against me because of this and that. Not, not yeah. because of this and that, you know? Yeah. How about when, when you're working your butt off mm. and you have spiritual experience with people that you're teaching and they never progress and you feel like, why am I not getting the the numbers, you know, the statistics no, or whatever? No, it's, it's all pride. How, like, I know, but like, how do you cope with realizing that you are still successful when your numbers might not feel like you are successful? Does yeah. that make sense? No. All the things that you report to your district or zone leaders, you're like, I don't have anything to report. It's all zeros yeah. this week. Like, I tried my hardest, but it doesn't show up in the numbers. How do you deal with that? Well, you just have to let go of your pride and know and be honest with yourself, you know? Is it zero because you actually were being lazy or is it zero because you did your best, you know? Because in the end of the day, that doesn't matter. What mattered is what difference you made in, mm-hmm. in your area, you know? There are times where my companion and I worked really, really hard. You know, like the most number we have on, on that record was how many hours of tracking we did, you know? Like we did 80 hours of tracking, but everything is zero. <laughs> You know, yeah, and and you know, you you gave your best and you did everything you can. You know, I mean, think about it. You know, Jesus Christ was here and he worked really, really hard. Do you think everybody listened to him? Do you think everybody wanted to follow him? They you crucified know? him. Yeah, absolutely. You know? it, it looked like he was a failure. Yeah, with how he ended. Yeah, I and mean, then he came you... up three days later. But exactly, like, seriously, right? yeah, that's the biggest mic drop. Yeah. But at the same time, <laughs> like if you put his record onto a sheet of paper, what that gonna look like? Yeah. You know, how many baptisms did he have? You know, like all that stuff. But because of what he did, we still listen and study and, and do everything from what he taught back then. Yeah. You know, think about that. Yeah. The, even though, even if you had zero, mm-hmm. what that impact of that little hard work would do 20 years from now, you know? Yeah. And, and I've had experiences where like, we taught this person every single week and it was very spiritual every single week. She kept saying, no, 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 no. No. Yeah, it was, it was, it was I was like, come on, you know, mm-hmm. like your husband's a member of the church. Well, she was also a very active practicing Jewish, which is great. Yeah. We actually, you know, learn a lot about Judaism. That's at her so cool. house, we, we played the games and, and yeah. everything. We did Hanukkah at her house. Yes, it was, it was really fun. that's so cool. Fun. And then like two years, Actually, like a year after my mission, I went and visited the area and I bore my testimony. I'm like, hey, I don't know if y'all know me, you know, I served there a year ago, blah, blah. And then she came up to me and she was like, hey, just say no, I joined the church six months ago. Oh, I'm my like, what? Goodness, yes. I know, I'm like, what? Why? You know, like, like I, I was asking, like, how? Mm-hmm. And she's like, not because of what you guys taught me every week, because your final testimony before you left the ward for some reason hit me. And I had no idea. I just bore me oh testimony and just told everybody how much I loved them. Yeah. And I'm like, so you know, I'm leaving tomorrow, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I guess that was, that was what made the, the difference. That's crazy. Yeah. That is so crazy. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's amazing. You know, they're still super active. Mm-hmm. Oh my uh, goodness. I love that so much. I once heard one of my friends told me this, um, and I agree with it for the majority of the part, but they said... <laughs> When you're going through a rough part in your mission and you just feel like you're just sowing seeds, you're not, you're not reaping or harvesting anything. You're just planting those yeah. seeds and you're like, Why, how come there are these people that are in the area next to mine 
that are just harvesting like crazy. And I'm over here just still planting like crazy. And um, the, the quote goes something along the lines, I'm probably going to butcher it, but it's like, the Lord trusts you more because he knows that you're still going to put your 100% effort in without the numbers. Yeah. And I think that's true. Um, I don't think he trusts you more than the missionaries in the other area next to you that's harvesting all the yeah. time. But I think everyone has times when they're harvesting and when they're they're planting. Maybe you might not even have a time when you might harvest in the way that we normally look at it with baptisms or mm-hmm. bringing people to church or whatever. But at the end of the day, you giving your best effort is what matters. Oh, yeah. And the Lord trusts you either way. And the main thing is keeping that trust. It's It's... One thing to be loved, and it's another thing to be trusted. Mm -hmm. And as a missionary, you are a consecrated servant of the Lord, and you are speaking with him. Yeah, 100%. It's so cool. I think we just have to remove the idea in our head that we go on a mission to baptize a ton of people. Mm -hmm. You know, because that is not why you go on a mission. Yeah. You go on a mission to show love. You go on a mission to serve, you know? That's one thing I loved about being a missionary compared to like regular life is I didn't have to take care of myself. Yeah. I didn't have to worry about what to wear because I yes. wear the same thing every day. I every didn't day. have to worry about what to eat. I didn't have to wear, worry about anything at all. All I had to worry about is how do I serve these people? Mm-hmm. How do I serve the branch or the war that I'm serving in? The people I just met. What can I do to make their lives better? So if we go on a mission knowing that like that's what we're meant to do, then you will have an amazing mission no matter how many or how less you bring into the waters of baptism. Yeah. But if you just go and be like, I'm going to baptize the whole nation, you know, yeah. I'm like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah. that's not the right way. You know, like, you don't, you don't, um, it's a stupid quote from, <laughs> not, not stupid, but it's kind of silly quote from um, the movie RM. We just watched it. Oh, yeah. They're like, so <laughs> he hungry. showed it to me. I haven't seen it before. So it was funny. <laughs> it, it was really funny. But like, you know, like in the beginning in the car, they're like, so how many, how many um, converts did you have? And the guy was like, just one, myself. Yes, and, and I, I love that. love that. I love know? that like, so I much. love that because you don't convert anyone at all. You don't, the spirit does that. Mm-hmm. You know, you convert yourself, mm-hmm. hopefully, you know. Yeah, you um, put yourself in the situation, you yeah. put in the effort during personal study yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that always stuck to me, you know, because you don't convert anyone yeah. at all. I love that. I love that so much. Me too. Mic drop. Mic drop moment right there. So <laughs> you throw the mic. Um, I'm going to check. This is still recording. This is exciting. I'm going to. This is so fun. I love, I love this. I love this. This is like. Too. This is like. This is like, this is, I know. I like there's so many times I'm like, oh my gosh. This is like. And it's so nice to feel the spirit like saying like, this is what I want you to be doing with mm. like your talents and your energy yeah. and your time. Like. I'm just excited to see who else hops on this podcast. Oh, yeah, no. It's going to be so fun. It's going to be amazing. Oh, my goodness. I'm so excited. Okay, so this is what I kind of want to call the Gordon B. Hinckley segment of the podcast. When I first came up with this idea, this is the first thing that came to me. And so you know the story of Gordon B. Hinckley. He goes on his mission. Oh, yeah. And he writes his dad a note. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting your money. Mm -hmm. Nothing's happening. Like, it's the number problem that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. He's like, I don't feel successful. This is a waste of everything. I want to go home. And his dad said, do you, do you know what the quote is? I don't remember. Forget, forget yourself and, and to get work. to work. Yeah. Crazy. And so that's kind of what did it for him. That's what helped him stay on his mission. I think everyone has a moment, at least one. Mm-hmm. I had it multiple times on my mission. I, I've had it. Yeah, yeah. I think everyone, and I think on your mission and also after you're like, life gets hard. It gets crazy. But especially as a missionary, you have times when you're like, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Am I on the right track? Should I, should I go home? Like, what helped you stay out when you had thoughts like that? So, you know, um, everybody gets their trunky moment. Whether they, <laughs> the trunky moment. The trunky moment. Whether they <laughs> admit it or not. And I had mine. And it's, it's, it's funny because um, I had my trunky moment when I had a companion I didn't get along with. Mm-hmm. And that's when I was like, I want to go home. Yeah. I don't want to do this, you know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And the thing is, that was me being prideful, you know. Yeah. Like, Van didn't do anything wrong. He was mm-hmm. just probably being himself, you know. Yeah. I'm just, I just need to accept that he's different from me, and we need to, like, figure out how to work together, you know. Yeah. It sounds, okay, this is going to sound, um, I don't know, like, funny or weird, but, like, my, my, my mom always told me, like, when you're on your mission, if you do the Lord's work 100%, he will take care of you after your mission, you know. Like, mm-hmm. he will give you whatever you need. He will bless you. Mm-hmm. And he will bless your entire family. He will bless everybody you love. And so I, I, I always thought about that. You know, like if I give up now, you know, am I going to like, I know the Lord's not going to 
you know, abandon me if I gave up on my mission, you know? But I'm like, I'm intrigued, you know? Like, what blessings would I get? You know, like, it sounds prideful, but like, yeah. what bless yeah. blessing would the Lord give me if I, you know, like, finish my mission honorably? Mm -hmm. um, that's like my prideful, like, <laughs> way of like, Coping, processing it processing. yeah you're like well it stinks right now but in the future it won't. <laughs> i know i know but um but at the same time you know there of course you know um there are some like spiritual um changes as well mm -hmm. um you just, to me is going back to the reason of why you went on your mission yeah you know um why did i go why did i decide to go on my mission and going back into that uh I, I wrote them in my journal you know like years before my mission and i remember writing down the night i realized i needed to go on my mission and i wrote down why and i read that like i just keep going back to that and i'm like okay now i know why yeah wow yeah i love that so yeah. much it was, it was an incredible experience you know um i mean i can share you why i served the mission yeah go for it um <clears throat> A year before my mission, I actually did not want to go on a mission. I, I was like, I'm going to go finish college. I'm going to get a degree, and then I'll go on a mission. You know, that was Fun like, fact, he never finished college. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I never did. I never did. I did two years, and that was it. You're like, nope. nope. So I'm glad you went on a mission instead. <laughs> yes, I'm glad I went on a mission instead. Because, so I graduated high school early. I was 15 and a half when I graduated high school. So I went to college. Uh, How many years do you take? Like, is it 12 years in the Philippines as well? Like, graduating at 15 is nuts. So I we, graduated we have, at, like, 19. Yeah, it's crazy. So we have, <laughs> um, we have you know, like, the preschool, all that stuff, and it's uh, first to sixth grade. And then after sixth grade, you hop into um, senior year, I mean, soft, um, freshman year of high school, straight into senior. So okay. four years, six, ten years. Ten years, we have ten okay. years of school. But we also went to school 7 a.m. until like 5.30 p.m. Yeah, that's every ridiculous. Single that's terrible. <laughs> so like they basically Jesus. blended all of your middle school in there. Ew. Um, yeah, so I graduated at 15 and a half and I went straight to college. So um, when I was 18, um, I had like two years already done. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to finish. You know, I have two more years. I'll get my degree and, and I'll go on my mission. But then uh, the missionaries in my ward, they're like, you want to work with us tonight? And I'm like... Sure, you know, I like finish all my homework, I'll, I'll go. So we went into um, this family's house that they were teaching. This family, um, they live in a tiny little grass hut. Hmm. Literally like 10 feet by like 5 feet. It was so tiny. And it was elevated, so you have to like, um, so that way it's not touching the ground. So you have to like step up, like a couple steps up, and then it's just like bamboo floor <laughs> with bamboo walls. It's and, unreal. And coconut leaves roof. Yeah. Tiny, tiny. It's super cozy, but it's tiny. And then they have three kids, three mm -hmm. daughters. Um, they're probably about like, you know, between six to 11. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they were so excited. They were all smiling when the missionaries and I walked in. And the mom was like, hey, just so you know, my husband was able to find a job today so we can, uh, so we could provide dinner for you guys. I know. I already. I'm like, oh my god. I'm gonna cry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to eat their food. Yeah. And like, so they, they, they. I'm crying right now. Um, they, they prepared this meal, and it was like, you know, like a meat that was basically fat. So it's like the the not the best part of the meat, you know. Yeah. But that's what he could afford, and he was so excited that they were able to cook for the missionaries, and they're all just looking at us as we eat because it was it wasn't enough for everyone. And I did not want to eat. Like, I did not want to eat, you know? Like, uh -huh. thankfully, I grew up um, with a pretty well family in the Philippines. So we had, you know, like, food and all that stuff. But, like, that was so heartbreaking to me to see, you know? And um, so they were eating. And um, um, they taught them the, fa the, the plan of salvation. And when the missionaries, uh, missionaries started teaching about how families can be together forever, the couple, they just started crying. They were just bawling their eyes out. And then they, they, they opened up, they said that they just lost a, a, a daughter who was like a couple of years old. And she got really sick, didn't have enough money, well, money at all to like take her to the hospital, so she just died. Yeah. And um, since um, the, the child wasn't baptized in the Catholic church, they told her that like, 
they told him that she couldn't be buried in the Catholic plot, that her spirit would go to purgatory because she wasn't baptized. Oh my gosh. It was, it was so heartbreaking. I mean, I can't even imagine. I have kids, you know? Yeah. I can't even imagine somebody telling me that your deceased child will go to hell. And they have, like, authority or whatever like, yeah. to say that. That's scary. Yeah, and somebody who have no education and have no authority or have nothing. Yeah. They, all they had to do is just accept that. And it, it was devastating. And so we, we, we were teaching them, and, and the missionaries were bearing a testimony of how they will see their daughter again. <laughs> and, and how, you know, if they get still in the temple, they will see their daughter again. They're all going to be together. And that their daughter is perfect. And that their daughter is with God. And, and they were just all crying. I'm crying right now. Um, I remember going home that night, writing in my journal, Telling myself I am so selfish because I knew these things, took it for granted, where I could literally go anywhere the Lord would take me and tell them these good news. Yeah. You know, and that's the reason why I went on my mission, to tell them the good news. I love that. And so you would read that in your hard moments of your mission and you'd remember that experience. Yes. And, you know, it was exactly a year um, after I got my, actually, when I wrote it down a year later, exactly a year later, that's when I got my mission call. Um, but yeah, I would, I would always go back into that page and realize that this is the reason why I go on a mission. I went on my mission. I love that yeah. so much. So for people that are listening to this, I don't know who is even going to listen to this at all. <laughs> We're just making this. I know. Um, but for people that might be preparing to serve a mission, pick a spiritual experience that is leading to you want to serve a mission and like read it often. Write it down. Because if you will look for a spiritual experience, you will have one, mm-hmm. you know? A lot of people are like, oh, I haven't had that yet. I'm like, yeah. are you actually like trying? Ask, seek, Ask, knock, yeah. and you shall find. Yeah. Like, you know, like the, 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 the heavens are, are near, you know, like the miracles are around us. You just have to look for it because yeah. if you're not, you're not going to find it. Yeah. So true. So true. Um, your experience with the food. Can I share an experience Absolutely. that I had on my mission? I don't think I've told you this. So I was serving <laughs> in, um, oh, I served my mission in upstate New York. And there was, this, there was this less active, we were going through the less active list and we were just calling a bunch of numbers. And I think we maybe had like two people that actually answered. Yeah. Um, one of them didn't really want to hear from us. But one of them that did answer, um, he, he's like, no way. It's the elders. And we're like, hey. And he's like, he's like, how do you know it was my birthday? And we're like, we did it. And so we immediately started singing happy birthday. Um, and we set up a lesson with him. And that first time that we came over to his house, um, he, he fed us a big meal. He's from Africa or whatever. Mm-hmm. He like, made all this nice African rice. And it was like very, like, it was some of the best tasting food, but it was like made out of unique parts of meat that I don't think normally people like would buy or use. Yeah. And it was like really good, but I was like, dang, this is, I was like, you're so nice. You didn't need to make us anything. Yeah. Um, and so anyways, we, we left his house. It became a thing that we would visit him and taught him. Um, and we were helping him get ready for the temple. And uh, we, we were going over for the last time before I was getting transferred and I gave him a blessing. And uh, it was one of the most, spiritual blessings that I've ever been a part of in my life. Um, but then he's like, Oh, dude, I want to show you something. And he starts opening up his cabinets. He shows us all of this food in his pantry. And he's like, Oh, there's, I have all this food. And we're like, that's awesome. Brother John Fee. Like you always feed us really good food. And he's like, no, I want you to know something. When you first came over, I made the last food that I had in my pantry. I didn't eat that night. And I wasn't planning on being able to eat for a few days. I don't have a job. And now the Lord blessed me because I fed his servants. And now he was blessed with food and he's getting ready to go to the temple. And that is just, the miracles are real that happen on the mission. Miracles do happen a lot, you know, a lot. It's amazing. I love that. It's so amazing. Oh my gosh. That's so. Amazing. I guess any final words of wisdom or advice for people that are currently serving or about to serve or people that are about to come home, anything that the spirit is? Well, you know, to the ones that wanted to serve, do it for the right reason, you know, do it for the right reason. Don't do it for yourself. Don't do it for, for, I mean, don't do it, do it for yourself. Don't do it for other people. Don't do it for 
expectations, you know, like, oh, it'll be good for the family, oh, it'll be good for you someday, you know, mm -hmm. don't, because that's very selfish. Do it for yourself, do it for the Lord, do it because you have a relationship with the Lord, do it because you will make a difference in this world, you know? You might, you might, you know, find it hard or you're gonna like miss your family and friends, you're, you're gonna be like, oh, I'm so restricted to do certain things that I'm used to doing, you know, but the thing is, it's not about you. It's, it's about the work that you do. It's about the changes that you'll make. So if you want to go on mission, make sure you are 100% committed to the Lord. You know, don't, don't go wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not going to be easy, but it's going to be the most rewarding thing you'll ever do. I've, I've been home 18 years now, and I still think about it every day. And, and, and He tells me all the time, he's like, I wish I was just a missionary. <laughs> I know. I, I've had dreams where, like, I, 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 in my dreams, I'd be, like, talking to my wife. I'm like, I'm so sorry, but I got a call. I have to leave you guys, you and the kids, for two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's and so it's, it's crazy because I, I absolutely love that. You know? And the ones that are just, you know, getting in a mission or you're in a mission and struggling right now, I, I, you know, just forget yourself and, and go to work because, because it's not about you, you know, you will struggle. Sure. Yeah. But the thing is you're taken care of. The Lord got your back. All you have to do is do what he asked you. You know, it's not that, it's not that hard, you know, you just share the gospel. And the thing is, if you're hesitant to share the gospel, then maybe you need to evaluate your testimony because it's true. It, it's, it does nothing but help people. Why wouldn't you want others to have that blessing, you know? And the ones that are going home, finish off strong. A lot of the times it gets, it gets really hard towards the end of the mission because you just want, you're just done or you're just like too excited to go home. You know what? You have the rest of your life to, to experience everything. This is once in a lifetime experience. Finish hard, finish strong because you will always remember that, you know? You will always, you know, treasure that. that these are the stories that you're going to be telling your grandkids someday. Yeah. And, and, and if you know that you finished diligently, then it will, it will be such a good, like, you know, like, I am done. I'm great, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like the cliche quote that I heard all the time on mission. You have two years to live it, mm -hmm. and then you have an eternity to reflect on it. 100%. And it's, it's true. Yep. Yeah. Gospel's true. Book is blue. Um, <laughs> yes, you guys do that. <laughs> yeah, the book is blue. If you serve for two. <laughs> that whole <laughs> cringy thing. Um, I think what helps a missionary, like, fully go in and, like, start to find joy in the work is when they don't have one foot in the world and one foot in, mm -hmm. foot in the mission. All in. All in. What helped you make that shift? And I think we'll probably end on that note. Um, like, how did I... Yeah, how did you, how did you transition? Because being a normal person to becoming a missionary, that's kind of a transition. I mean, you came to a freaking different country. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. understand anybody, you know, <laughs> like, I, um, well, it's funny because, um, I struggled the first three days of my mission because I've never been apart from my family. And I, I'm always homesick. Like, I don't like going on vacation because I cry. I'm like, I miss home. I miss my bed, you know? I don't even use other people's bathroom because I just want to use my own home bathroom. You know what I mean? I was that kind of person. <coughs> and then all of a sudden, I'm in a 24-hour flight to the other side of the world, you know? Like, there's no going back. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I came from the tropics to the middle of winter yeah. in Provo, and I was freezing to death, <laughs> and I missed home. And the food sucked. <laughs> and I couldn't understand everybody because, mm -hmm. you know, everybody spoke too fast. Um, but the, the thing is, like, um, I mean, this is my perspective coming from a different country. Yeah. Going all in. I felt like I was alone for some time, you know. But then... I realized when I prayed to God, I actually prayed to him in Tagalog. I don't, I rarely pray in English, which I do once in a while, or like when I do it like publicly, but when I'm on my own, I actually pray in Tagalog. And then I realized, you know, one time I was praying at the FTC and I was feeling alone, I was crying, and I was speaking in Tagalog, and I was like, you know what? He knows me, you know, like, he speaks my language. 
you know, like he got my back, you mm -hmm. know, we're, we're on this together. And that made me realize I need to like, just be here, you know, be, do the work because he's, he's got me. I love that. Yeah. I love that so much. Well, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast. Yeah, that was amazing. This was thank fun. You. I feel yeah. like even though we don't know what we're doing, I think this turned out, we had a good conversation. Oh, no, absolutely. I felt this spirit multiple times. You know, it's just like, it was, it was such a great experience. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, we can bring in some more people that have like amazing stories because I would love to like hear what you who you talk to and like it's so fun yeah. i think i think what i'm planning on doing is i'm gonna get a mic set up and a camera set up that is like tra like when i'm traveling Horrible. and stuff yeah. then i can do things and then eventually once this becomes like a really cool town hopefully with our studio upstairs then we can have a cool studio spot where we can fly people in for different things like that because be they're gonna want to see the castle anyways oh so. yeah absolutely it'll be fun that'd be awesome Yay! Awesome. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to the first ever episode of the Missionary Podcast. This has been this has been a party. Mm -hmm. um, share it with somebody that is planning to serve a mission, who's on a mission, anybody that you feel like the Spirit is prompting you to send it to, send it to them. And if that's if the main thing of the prompt the Spirit prompting you to do is to serve somebody, act on something that you heard. That's all that matters. That's the main goal with this podcast is to help you come closer to the Savior. So. Um, without further ado, we'll see you in the next podcast. All right. Sounds good. Boom. See you guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye.